In 48 BC, Rome was the most powerful city in the world, but it was far from the most developed. The city that Cicero referred to as Romulus's cesspool had grown organically and lacked the cohesive urban plan of eastern capitals like Alexandria. So when Julius Caesar found himself on a prolonged stay in Alexandria, thanks to a siege by forces loyal to Cleopatra's brother, he had time to familiarize himself with the opulent luxury of the city that had been founded and planned by Alexander the Great himself. The many months that Caesar spent holed up in Alexandria left him resolved to remake Rome in the image of this gorgeous Hellenistic metropolis. But more than the marble facades of Alexandria's buildings or the geometric grid street plan, Caesar was reportedly most impressed by Alexandria's famous library and made plans to build a library in Rome that would surpass the one in the Ptolemaic capital and would be open to all the people of the city. Rome had extensive private libraries that were the preserve of the elite, and though Roman intellectuals like Cicero, Varro, and Calpurnius Piso maintained extensive collections, these would not have been available to the general public. Caesar hoped to change that. The Great Library of Caesar was just one of the dictator's many initiatives and reforms that quickly fell by the wayside after the Ides of March. With Rome plunged into another decade of uncertainty and political intrigue that culminated in the Republic's final civil war, those at the top of Roman politics had more pressing concerns than making literature and learning available for the plebeians. However, Caesar's heir Octavian would eventually seize sole control of the state, and did decide to honor his adoptive father's wish with the construction of a grand library. But like all of Octavian's projects, this library would be a tool for his propagandists to manufacture consent for his new regime. Octavian is known to us today as Augustus, which is not a proper name, but a title. It roughly translates to revered one. So the fact that this title has become synonymous with the man is a stark indication of the success of his propaganda. Famous writers such as Livy, Horace, and Virgil were supported by the regime, and it is no accident that Virgil's masterwork, the Aeneid, paints Augustus as the logical culmination of all Roman history, right down to the very beginnings of the Roman people through their spiritual ancestor, the Trojan refugee, Aeneas. But the output of positive literary depictions of Augustus was only one half of the princeps' propaganda strategy. He also engaged in a suppression campaign dedicated to silencing the authors who had a different vision for Rome. This ranged from those with overt republican inclinations, who opposed one-man autocratic rule, to more libertine writers like Ovid, whose attitudes towards sex ran counter to Augustus's conservative moral reforms. It was in this context that Augustus constructed his grand library on the Palatine Hill, the second public library in the city, and by far the most magnificent. But rather than serve as a repository for all learning, like the Great Library of Alexandria, Augustus's library would house works that agreed with official imperial ideology. Augustus was working to make knowledge more readily available, but only the politically correct works that adhered to the shifting ideology of the empire. The building itself was located within the magnificent Temple of Apollo that Augustus had constructed as part of his private residence on the Palatine Hill. Occupying some of the finest real estate in the city, that had once been the location for the mansions of the most wealthy and distinguished senators. Generations of civil wars, and Augustus's brutal prescriptions, had resulted in the extinction of many illustrious noble families, and the princeps was eager to make use of this new real estate for his home, as well as for the temple and its associated library. Apollo, god of knowledge, was his patron deity after all. The library boasted two halls, one for Greek, and one for Latin books. Symbolic of his efforts to bring all knowledge, and even religion, under his sway, Augustus would transfer the sacred books of Sibylline prophecy from the Temple of Jupiter to his library complex, removing the ability of anyone but the princeps to consult texts that had guided the state for centuries. The library was so large that it even served as a meeting place for the Senate, confirming that Augustus's library was more a symbol of his uncontested power than it ever was a center of learning. Being accepted into this library as a writer, a scholar, or a senator was a sign of official approval, 
and this point would not have been lost on anyone who entered the building. And as the case of Ovid makes abundantly clear, the difference between official approval and sanction had serious consequences for writers during the Augustan era. The library was an attempt to make this seal of approval visible to the entire populace, so that everyone would be able to understand which texts, ideas, and even topics of conversation would ingratiate them with the new regime. Though open to the public, it is important to remember that this was not designed to benefit the average working plebeian. Literacy in the city was between 10 to 20 percent, and anyone with time on their hands to consult antiquated Greek texts was bound to be a member of the upper echelons of Roman society. By shaping the worldviews of Rome's intelligentsia, Augustus was simply using the same bread and circuses approach that had proved so effective with the urban poor. But Augustus's totalitarian inclinations meant that his censorship required more than simply excluding books by authors he disapproved of. He would engage in active campaigns to purge and destroy all writings that contradicted imperial ideology. When the historian and scholar Titus Labienus emerged as an outspoken critic of Augustus's one-man rule, the princeps ordered a show trial that saw him condemned for treason, simply for speaking out in favor of the restoration of political rights. All of Labienus's works were ordered to be burned, and the scholar killed himself in protest, but would not allow his family to cremate his body, as he refused to let the same element which had destroyed his life's work, destroy his body as well. This gesture was remarkably bold, and was meant to shame Augustus in a culture that esteemed a proper burial as a necessity. Since all of Labienus's works are lost to us, it is one of the few examples we have of his forceful character. But it wasn't simply activists and critics that had their works consigned to the flames by Augustus. He also ordered the destruction of thousands of ancient religious texts that had been used to guide ritual and worship in the city for hundreds of years. As they are lost to us now, we have no idea what they said which provoked the ire of Augustus. Even his adoptive father was not safe from censorship, as several tragic plays and poems authored by Julius Caesar himself were destroyed because they ran afoul of Augustus's strict sexual morality laws. Though innumerable texts are now lost to us forever due to his actions, even the almighty Augustus lacked the power to alter the life, literature, and culture of Rome. He believed that one-man rule would result in stability, but just a generation later, Caligula would prove just how unstable a government can be when it is subject to the whims of a single individual. Yes, Caligula's sexual behavior and appetite for spectacle ran counter to Augustus's vision of a proper emperor, but Caligula also differed from Augustus in his attitudes towards literature. Perhaps it was because he was the grandson of Mark Antony, who Augustus had defeated, but Caligula ordered the works of Titus Labienus be sought out so that they could be copied and preserved. Stranger yet, Caligula even made his distaste for Virgil's Aeneid known, and the work fell out of favor during his reign. Though fortunately for us, the epic poem did survive, it isn't too difficult to imagine a timeline where a longer and more stable reign for Caligula resulted in fewer copies of the Aeneid being made and none surviving through the ages. The totalitarian powers Augustus invested in the office of the princeps would ultimately be the undoing of Rome. But had things gone only slightly differently, they could have been the undoing of his legacy as well. Hi, this is Titus from Tribunet. If you enjoyed the video you just saw by Gaius, and if you're interested in thoughtful content that explores the complex culture of the ancient Romans, don't forget to hit like and subscribe.